When I was four, I used to introduce myself by saying, Bonjour, uh, my name is André, I'm a boy. I already had long hair and was often mistaken for a girl, which I found very funny. I'm four, I don't eat candy, and I don't go to school. And to introduce myself today, I will use the same sentence because very few things have changed for the last 40 years. My name is still André, I'm still a boy, I'm still a child, I'm a 44-year-old child, I still don't eat candy, and I never went to school. Which makes me, in our educative landscape, kind of an exception. Being an exception, has always been surprising to me because what I have lived is the most natural thing one could have lived. I am an ordinary child, as ordinary as a mango pit that is put in water. After a few days, some roots and a stem will come out, and none of us would say, wow, that is a very gifted mango pit. It is the nature of the pit to grow, as it is the nature of the child to grow and to learn. Children cannot not learn all the time. All children of the world are equipped with an impressive set of native spontaneous dispositions. It means that each one of us is equipped with those dispositions, and no handicap could deprive us of them. This is what I want to talk about today, because trusting those dispositions creates a new attitude, not a new method, a new attitude, which I call ecology of childhood. I will introduce the first of one of those dispositions by asking you a question. What is the first thing that a child does when he is left alone? He plays. All children of the world play, and if they were never interrupted, they would play forever. All children play whatever the circumstances. The eagerness of a child to play is even stronger than pain. We all know that. Now, neurobiology and modern science bring out interesting information. Playing is the best learning device ever designed. There is no better way to learn than playing. We should write that on the fridge. When you know that, you might ask yourself what would happen to a child who would be allowed to play not only one day, but, I don't know, for 44 years? Furthermore, a child does not differentiate playing from learning. For children, playing or learning are synonyms, which is quite logical. And when a child is asked to stop playing and start learning, it does not make more sense to him than than if I was asking you to breathe without letting the air in. But when an adult is demanding something absurd from a child, the child never allows himself to think that something is wrong with the adult. He always thinks that something is wrong with himself that the problem is his. And when a child thinks that something is wrong with himself, neurobiology shows us how the networks of pain are activated in his brain. This deserves to be known. I will now tell you about the second spontaneous disposition of children. I'm very lucky to work with a German neurobiologist, Professor Dr. Gerald Hüther. Scientists have long been thinking that our brains were programmed by our genes to be either smart or stupid, and then they recently discovered that it couldn't be so because the area in the brain controlling thumb movement is much more developed in the brain of teenagers nowadays. Then they thought brains were like muscles that we only needed specific training programs for the brain, which would make our brains grow bigger. And it was a complete failure. Then the most recent discovery was made, the discovery of the century. It so happens that our brain grows when we use it with enthusiasm. And that's something else we already knew. 
Enthusiasm gives us wings, gives us the ability to achieve anything. Scientists describe enthusiasm as brain fertilizer. When we are enthusiastic, we are geniuses. It means there is a genius within each one of us, only waiting for one thing, our enthusiasm. This is a call for trust. Not only are we all equipped with the best learning device ever de even designer playing, but we also carry our mobile brain, mobile brain fertilizer. However, if we want our enthusiasm to be complete and sincere, we must get rid of hierarchies of jobs, of subjects, and children show us the way, since they don't know any of those hierarchies. Children show us the way, provided we also free ourselves from the irony we have towards them, and thus with, towards the child within ourselves. Children show us the way, and 20 years ago, when I met the, for the first time my guitar-making master, Werner Scheer, he told me something that would deserve an entire talk. He told me, I can show you everything, but I can't teach you anything. And then, he immediately gave me some precious wood to start making a guitar. And he, he didn't tell me, oh, do you know what that is? Yes, it is wood, oh, you know that. Uh, and do you know where the wood comes from? Yes, it comes from the tree, you know that. Oh, and do you know where the trees live? Yes, the trees live in the forest. Oh, I have, no, I have a good idea. Let's go together in the magic forest and to find a beautiful tree and get some beautiful wood to make a nice little guitar. Okay? When we get rid of this irony towards children, they show us the way. Instead of always asking ourselves, what could I teach this child? We could ask ourselves, what could I learn from children? For example, children are masters of open-mindedness and open-heartedness. They go to other people regardless of their skin color, their religion, their income, their age, there is no need to teach, to teach t children tolerance. They don't know intolerance. There is no need to work hard to reach the world they are showing us. We only shouldn't leave our native state. This openness is their third spontaneous disposition. There is a fourth one, which is the disposition to go into the world, to meet other people, to meet diversity. Children are team workers, strongly connected to this intuition that diversity, that all our differences are factors of mutual enrichment. Your knowledge, my knowledge, what can we achieve together that we wouldn't be able to reach on our own? The worst thing that could happen to a child would be staying at home. This is not what I have lived then not only would the child have to share the little knowledge of his parents, but what's worse, he would have to share all his parents' fears. My son, Antonin, is very fond of climbing trees, which frightens me a lot. If he was only living with me, he would never climb trees. Fortunately, he goes into the world and meets people who are not afraid when he does, and some will even climb up with him. Here's a little story about what it looks like when children go into the wide world. Antonin was less than three years old as his grandfather gave him a small combine harvester about that big. He wanted to know what it was, and thanks to videos on the web, he could see it. Otherwise, it would have been quite difficult to explain to a two-year-old child what a combine harvester was in Paris in February. Afterwards, Antonin spent the whole winter harvesting every horizontal surface he could find, the following summer, we were driving along fields when, he sh when suddenly Antonin shouted, Moissonneuse batteuse! Moissonneuse batteuse! So we stopped the car. He went out. No, just try to picture this. Our little three-year-old child and a huge combine harvester. It's coming closer and closer, becoming bigger and bigger, and finally stops at the feet of the little child. Boom. The door opens, and the driver asks, do you want to come in? 
Then he tells me, you can come in too. So we both go into the huge combine, and we stay in the cabin for two hours because he wants to show Antonin everything, and that's fortunate because Antonin wants to know everything. And the driver tells us, you know, I have been harvesting those fields for five days. It's the first time someone is seeing me. The first person who is really seeing him is this little human being. And you know, not only is he looking at him, but he is looking at him with great admiration. Then everything changes for the driver. He is deeply moved. He has recovered all his enthusiasm and love for his job. He goes out of the cabin, grabs a few grains of wheat, puts them in Antonin's hand and tells him, you see that? That is future bread. That's something sacred we are doing here. He doesn't want us to go, yet after two hours, we do have to leave him. But he asks my phone number and calls me the next morning, saying, I am back with my combine harvester, you could bring Antonin. And he's so afraid that I could refuse, that he adds, without giving me time to breathe. If you have no time to stay, it's not a problem for me to take care of him all day. That is how it is when children go into the world. Everything is changed for them. Everything is changed for the others. They plant new seeds in the hearts of the people they meet. They allow them to recover their enthusiasm to play again. All of this is a call for trust, for a new attitude. Coming up here today, I have no hidden agenda, but I have a dream. And I believe that this world should commit itself to achieving the goal of having a new attitude towards children. This attitude, this ecology of childhood, is possible for every one of us, wherever we are, in the streets, at school, at home, in the fields, in the trees. And my conviction is that there will be no peace on Earth if we are not at peace with childhood. Instead of putting ourselves and putting children under pressure, willing them to change, to become someone they are not, to meet, our expectation to have good grades, a good university, a good diploma, a good job, a good spouse, a good house, a good car, and good kids. What a relief it will be to simply meet children wherever, wherever they are and simply let them feel that they are perfect just the way they are. You are perfect just the way you are. I wish you a lot of trust and a lot of enthusiasm.